Thank you very much and thank you for the introduction and I'm very happy to be able to speak today in this seminar. Um, so yeah, so I'm going to talk about, um, again, about, about torsion pairs. So the, the work that I'll talk to you about today is joint work that will appear on the archive, I hope by the end of next month. Um, and it's joint work with Didier Angeleri Hugel, Jan Stovacek, and Georges Vitoria. Um, and we have a joint project where we're looking at um, an operation called mutation in the context of uh, what we kind of refer to as large silting theory. But this is a theory that um, looks at certain torsion pairs in triangulated categories. And we've been looking at the idea of um, this operation of mutation on, the, on these torsion pairs um, and what this means, how we can interpret it. So what I want to talk to you about today is um, an interaction with this, uh, this operation of mutation with um, a, a structure that arises in the study of torsion pairs and representation theory. And these are the so-called wide intervals. So let me start by um, introducing the, these ideas, the idea of wide intervals. Um, and then I'll end the talk by talking about this connection with mutation. So, um, yeah, so let me start with the definition of a torsion pair because uh, it's good to get everybody on the same page, although I understand that there are people already working on these things. So this will be a, a very sort of um, elementary start. But the, these torsion pairs will arise throughout the talk and they will be in one of two settings. Either they'll be in an abelian category or in a triangulated category. But we can give the same definition for both settings um, if we're sort of uh, a bit sneaky. Um, so a pair of full idempotent complete subcategories, TF. So this idempotent complete, you can just think of as just meaning that it's closed under some ands, because in most contexts that I'll talk about today, this means the same thing. So you have two full subcategories closed under some ands. Then this pair is called a torsion pair if they're homorthogonal. So there's no non-zero homomorphisms from any objects in T to any objects in F. And these two full subcategories are sufficient to reconstruct the category completely um, by this operation called, that I'm denoting by the star product. So in particular, C is equal to the star product of T with F. So this last part of the definition requires me to define what I mean by this star product. And the reason I've written it like this is it means something slightly different in the abelian or the triangulated setting. So, um, let me tell you this definition. So if we have two full subcategories, so in our definition, these would be T and F, then the star product of these M and N in the abelian setting are the objects in the category that are contained in the middle of a short exact sequence where the first term is in M and the second term is in N. So another way of saying this last condition, C equals the star product of T and N, is to say that for all objects in C, there exists a short exact sequence. So that's what this abbreviation means, um, that is like this, where Tx is in T and X over Tx is in F. So this is how the definition of a torsion pair usually looks. And in the triangulated setting, we give a similar definition. So the star product of M and N is the objects in C such that there exists a triangle instead of a short exact sequence where um, the first term is in M, then we have our object X, the third term is in N, and then of course the final object is the shift of M. So again, this means that for any object in our category, there exists a triangle um, where the first term is in our first class and the second term is, the last term is in the third class. Uh, the last term is in our second class. Okay, 
So the kind of um, stero- the classic examples of torsion pairs in these two different settings are the following. So if we take our category C to be an abelian category, and in particular the category of abelian groups, then we can take um, all of the torsion abelian groups to be our T. So that's this. And so that's where every element has finite order and then we take our f to be the full subcategory of torsion free groups so every element apart from zero has infinite order and then for every abelian group you can find um, a subgroup given by all of the elements of finite order and this is clearly torsion and then when you factor out you have something that's torsion free so this is where torsion pairs get their name okay um so please, I wanted to say, stop me if there's anything, if I'm not used to really giving talks with slides, but I'm having some technical problems recently, so I thought it was safer. So stop me if I'm going too far or if anything's not clear. So just please interrupt. So this is the first example in the abelian setting. Um, so now let's um, look at an example in the triangulated setting. Um, and this is the so-called uh, standard T structure in the derived category of a ring. So we're gonna take as our category C, the derived category of the module category. So this is a triangulated category whose objects are complexes of modules. So we take um, a complex of modules, meaning a sequence of modules with maps between them such that the square is zero and I'm gonna donate, denote any such complex by X bullet. And then we take as our T, the complexes whose cohomology vanish for I greater than or equal to zero. And for F, the complexes whose cohomology vanishes for all um, negative degrees. So these two classes, there's no non-zero maps between them in the derived category. Um, and we can also, for any object X, um, this might have cohomology anywhere in the complex. So this, this uh, row kind of corresponds here. The object X bullet um, is an arbitrary complex, but we can truncate X um, to the, uh, I guess this is the um, left truncation um, where we do the smart truncation. So we take the same, entries as x to the left, and then we put the kernel of d minus one in degree minus one, uh, and then zeros everywhere else. And then the cohomology in um, degrees greater than or equal to zero will be zero. And then we do something analogous um, on the other side. So now we have a, we can consider this complex here, which is, uh, has zero cohomology in all negative degrees and then have the same cohomology as X in all non-negative degrees. Okay, so these are the, the two standard examples of torsion pairs. Um, one in an abelian setting and one in a triangulated setting. So yeah, I should say there's an extra object in this triangle that I haven't drawn, um, but there is, there is a complex here, which is the shift of this complex. Okay, so I hope that's clear and please uh, stop me if it's not. Okay, so these are torsion pairs and these are gonna be the kind of main players in the talk. But in fact, what I want to talk about is not so much the torsion pairs themselves, but the, how they relate to each other. So what we're gonna do throughout the talk is we're gonna fix an Ethereum ring called R and we're gonna consider the collection Tors are, which is all of the torsion pairs together. Um, so the, the class of torsion pairs, and we're gonna consider them as an ordered set with the following ordering. So a torsion pair TF is greater than or equal to another torsion pair UV. Um, if and only if the torsion class of the first torsion pair contains the torsion class of the second torsion pair. And if you put this ordering on the, the um, lattice of torsion, uh, if you put this ordering on the collection of all torsion pairs, then what you obtain is in fact a lattice. Okay, so we're gonna consider this uh, lattice and 
In particular, we want to look at certain intervals in the lattice. So we'll look at this notation here between the square brackets means we want to consider all of the torsion pairs that are bigger than UV and smaller than TF. Um, and then we're going to consider the torsion pair, the intervals that are called wide. And an interval is called wide if you look at the intersection of the larger torsion free class. So T is, is bigger than U. So we look at the intersection of T with uh, V, which it turns out will be will contain F. So we look at the intersection of the larger torsion class and the larger torsion free class. Um, and if this gives us a wide subcategory, then we call this interval wide. Um, and a wide subcategory just means that it's closed under kernels, co-kernels and extensions. And essentially a subcategory like this is an abelian subcategory of your larger um, abelian category. And these intervals were introduced by Assay and Pfeiffer in the paper that was published this year. And the reason that they were consider them, considering them is that they arise in several um, areas that are kind of adjacent to the representation theory of finite dimensional algebras. Um, for example, if you have a stability condition in the sense of Alastair King, then uh, on the category of finite dimensional modules over a finite dimensional algebra, then this gives rise to a wide interval um, and in various other places. But I'm not really an expert on those things. So I recommend that you look at the paper of Assay and Pfeiffer and explain where they arise. Okay, so let me um, illustrate this with an example. So if you take uh, this Netherian ring that we fixed to be the path algebra of the Kronecker quiver, so this is an example of a hereditary Netherian uh, ring, or really it's a finite dimensional algebra. Um, then its lattice of torsion classes looks like this picture here. So every lattice of torsion classes has a largest element given by the whole module category um, as the torsion class, as the class T, and then the zero, um, just the set containing zero, the zero module as the torsion free class and the kind the opposite uh, arrangement for the bottom element. Um, then the lattice of torsion classes looks like this. So each of these dots uh, represents a torsion class and the lines represent the fact that this torsion pair is greater than this torsion pair and there are no torsion pairs in between them. So this is the Hasse uh, diagram of the posets. Um, so in this example, we have a greatest element and a, a smallest element. Um, and on the left in between them, there's a single torsion class. And then on kind of on the right, but only, be, I mean, that has no mathematical meaning. I just mean in the picture. Um, there is a chain of torsion pairs uh, starting at the greatest element that's a countable chain. And on the other side, there's another countable chain um, going upwards. And then in this part here that I've colored blue, I haven't drawn this, but this part of the lattice um, is isomorphic to the power set of the projective line uh, P1 of K. So um, every, torsion pair in this part of the lattice can be identified with a subset of P1 of K and they're ordered uh, in the same way that the subsets of P1 of K are ordered by inclusion. So this is the structure of the lattice and we see that it has sort of a nice shape and we can describe it completely. And then the wide intervals um, are the following. Um, the, any, for any pair of adjacent um, points in the lattice, this is a uh, wide interval. And moreover, for any pair of points in this blue part, this is also a wide interval. But for example, if we took the interval between this point and this point, then this is not a wide interval. So it kind of distinguishes somehow this part of the lattice from this part of the lattice. You can't look at any intervals that involve elements from both classes. 
Okay, so this is an example that I'll come back to. Um, uh, but the, the plan for today is to try to understand these wide intervals inside the derived category. So what we're gonna do is kind of move our perspective from this lattice tors R in the module category into, the, into a derived setting, into a triangulated setting. Uh, so that's the first point. And then I want to uh, not only move kind of adjacent into the derived category, but I also want to extend each torsion pair to from a torsion pair in the category of finitely generated modules to a torsion pair in the category of all modules. And this will give us an, uh, an isomorphic lattice. And this will give us this connection to silting theory that I mentioned at the beginning. And via this connection in point two, we'll see that wide intervals can correspond to co-silting mutation. So this is the plan for today. So the first thing I want to do is move into the derived category. So this is section two and it's called wide intervals and HRS. So um, we're gonna consider now some torsion pairs in the triangulated setting. So we'll fix a triangulated category D. Uh, for example, you can just take the bounded derived category of little mod R. Then a torsion pair in D is called a T structure if the left-hand class is closed under shifts. And then if you have such a torsion pair, then this yields um, some further structure on your category. Um, in particular, the intersection of the minus one shift of X with Y is actually an abelian category, and this is called the heart. And we also can construct um, a functor called the cohomological functor corresponding to the torsion pair, to the T structure. Um, and this is usually denoted H zero T. This I won't talk about too much today, but the point is that every T structure gives you um, uh, some homological algebra relative to that T structure. So the, we've already seen an example of the T structure because this um, standard T structure that I mentioned in the bounded derived category um, is the left-hand class, the aisle is closed under shifts. And if you look at the intersection that I mentioned, um, we get the category of finitely generated modules over R. So this is an abelian category. And the, this functor that I mentioned turns out to be the usual cohomological functor. Uh, so it takes, um, it takes triangles to long exact sequences. And you can do the same thing in the unbounded derived category. Um, and these two T structures will be very important in the later part of the talk. Okay. So sorry. Yeah, please go ahead. Was there any condition on R? Uh, yeah, so we're gonna keep R to be Noetherian, but I guess you you need probably coherent to talk about the... So we can comfortably say that uh, uh, this module category is always a heart for some T structure. Yes, so if um, when your ring is, if you have a condition on your ring, for example, Noetherian, then you can always find the module category, both the finitely generated modules as a heart of a T structure and the category of all modules as the heart of a T structure. Exactly. Okay. Um, okay, so now, um, so as I was saying, we want to move torsion pairs from the module category into uh, the derived category. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna construct a T structure um, from a given torsion pair. So the first thing we do is we fix a T structure. And really, I want you to think about the T structures that I just mentioned in the example. So we're gonna fix uh, a T structure, but keep this standard one in mind. And then we're gonna fix a torsion pair in the heart. So since this is an abelian category, we can fix a torsion pair. Then we can construct a T structure, um, which I'll call T sub tau, uh, where we take X 
Tao to be the star product of T with X. And we take Y Tau to be the star product of F with Y shifted by minus one. And this is a T structure and it's called the HRS tilt of T with respect to Tau. And the HRS stands for Happel, Wright and Smalo who introduced them and they prove that this is indeed a T structure. So this should be sort of definition proposition because there's some, something to prove. Okay, so the next thing I want to do is um, illustrate this definition with a kind of um, drawing, a way to like picture it. Um, and so in order to do this, I want to um, think about, uh, so this, this picture is really, I think, what I always have in mind when I think about these HRS T structures. So I wanted to take a moment to describe it, but it only really looks like this if you have a hereditary ring. Um, so we're gonna consider the bounded derived category. And I really, I wrote DBA, but I mean this again. For example, we could take A to be this Kronecker algebra. And then in this case, when the ring is hereditary, every indecomposable object in DB mod A um, is a stalk complex. So it's just a complex where everything is zero except for in one degree. So it means we can kind of put our category uh, into pieces where in each of these squares, we only have uh, indecomposable modules in a given degree. So this square that I've drawn here, we're gonna imagine that in this part of the category, there are just stalk complexes where there's a module in degree zero. Um, and then, in this square, it will be in degree one, and in this square, it will be degree two, and so on and so on. So now that we have our category arranged as this kind of strip, then we can see the standard T structure as dividing this strip into two. So the, the um, left part of the T structure lives um, in the right-hand part of the category. So just from um, the one shift onwards and the right part just lives in the left part of the category. Okay, so I hope this kind of sketch is clear. Um, then this means that we have our module category uh, as the heart of this T structure just in this square. So this is the module category in degree zero. Okay, so I should write, yeah. Uh, sorry, I guess this is not quite right. These should be little, these should be small M's because I've taken the bounded derived category. Okay, so now it, to construct our HRS tilt, we, um, we need a torsion pair. So I'm just gonna draw the torsion pair in. Sorry, I make that a bit smaller. So it means that we have two classes in this heart. We have a class F and a class, um, a class T. And there are no homomorphisms between them. And then the way that we define the T structure is that the, the new right-hand side of the T structure is this part of the category. So we've taken the star product of F with the one shift of the left-hand side and the new uh, right-hand side of the T structure is this part that I'm coloring pink here. So I hope it's kind of clear what I'm doing so far. So it, remember in the definition, we had um, this star product and that's this. And then in this part of the definition, we had this star product and that's this green part. And then if we shift uh, the, the aisle, then we get that the, the heart of the T structure is the intersection that is kind of now this shaded part here. And it's just the star product of T minus one with F. So 
I hope this helps. This is a picture that I often keep in mind. Okay, so what can we use this, um, this construction for when, we, when it comes to wide subcategories? So let's see. So the question that we want to ask now is if we have two torsion pairs, so this construction just came from one torsion pair, but if we have two torsion pairs, then how are their HRS tilts related? And moreover, if the interval that this gives us is a wide interval, then how are, can we say something more about how they're related? So in fact, um, this is the first result of uh, our work, which is that we can say something about how these two T structures are related. So if we have such an interval, sorry, then in fact, it turns out that there is a torsion pair in the heart coming from mu that's given by, as its uh, left-hand part, the, we have T intersect V, and then as its right-hand part, we have the star product of F with U shifted by minus one. And moreover, if we, so this torsion pair is inside the heart of T mu, and if we then take the HRS tilt at that torsion pair, then we get the other torsion pair. So this is how the two things are related. Um, the point is, if you have an interval in your lattice, then the two HRS tilts are related by HRS tilt. So in other words, we have this heart of our original T structure. And inside here, we have two torsion pairs. We have U, V, and we have T, F. So these guys both live in here. And these torsion pairs each give us HRS tilts. So we get a new heart coming from mu and we have a new heart coming from tau. And what the proposition says is that there's a torsion pair, um, well, I won't write it out again, but we have a torsion pair sigma that lives in the heart H mu. And if you tilt at this torsion pair, then you get the uh, H tau. Um, so just to, uh, I hope make it clearer, but I don't know how helpful these pictures are. Let me just try to illustrate in this diagram. So we have uh, inside our torsion, uh, torsion class T, we have a smaller torsion class U. And uh, this implies that the torsion free class related to U is bigger than F, it contains F, so this is V. So we might have some intersection here um, between T and V. Um, and then if we do our, so let's see, we have this intersection. Um, then if we do our HRS tilt uh, and we consider the new heart, then uh, inside this new, so this red part is the heart corresponding to UV. So this was U. Um, let me delete this. Then, sorry. Was there a question or just no? Okay. So inside this this new heart that is the HRS tilt of um, UV, we have this class um, that's the intersection, and this is now a torsion class according to the proposition. So it says that this is a torsion class and the torsion free class is the star product of U and F. So it's this part. So it, what we're saying is that inside this new heart, there is, an, there is another torsion pair. And yeah, the second part says that the torsion pair relates the two T structures by HRS tilting. Okay, so are there any questions about this or is this clear? 
or okay maybe we can ask questions at the end if there's nothing specific i think there isn't uh, as yet sorry yeah there's uh, there's no question yet okay good um, okay, so this is our result. And uh, the kind of third part of the proposition is that if we have um, a wide interval, then this, this torsion part of the torsion pair inside H mu is a SER subcategory. So it's not just the torsion pair, it's a special kind of torsion pair. It's actually uh, the torsion class is closed under subobjects. Um, so a SER subcategory is a a subcategory such that for any short exact sequence, I should say, inside T intersect V, then we have that M is in TV if only if L and N are in T intersect V. And these SER subcategories are, um, they allow you to localize the category. So these come up um, very often. So by shifting into the derived category, we have a new characterization of wide intervals. Okay, so this was the kind of first part of the plan. We wanted to move the lattice of torsion classes into the derived category and then uh, understand these wide intervals in this new setting. So this is, um, this is done. So then the next thing we wanted to do was extend our torsion pairs to the uh, module category, the whole module category. And then this will give us a, rela uh, a relation to this large silting theory that I mentioned at the beginning. So a torsion pair in mod R is called co-silting if its torsion free class is closed under direct limits. So this is just a definition. Um, it's related to co-silting theory, which is why it has this name. Um, and I'll explain this a little bit later in the talk, what I mean by this. And um, we're gonna do the same thing as earlier. We'll consider the collection of all co-silting torsion pairs in um, the category of all modules. So these are not necessarily finitely gen generated um, and we'll order them in the same way. So ordered by inclusions of torsion classes. Uh, a question, please. Yes, please go ahead. I'm already thinking about the silting, a torsion pair being silting. Would you mm -hmm. describe that in terms of the torsion class? And it's uh, perhaps uh, inverse limit being... Uh... Uh, so it's... So silting, so I don't know if you're thinking about finitely generated sim silting the, or... The dualization yeah. of this. I know it's dualizing silting, so I'm wondering. So, so if you allow your silting to be um, infinitely generated, then the, the dual condition of this is that the torsion free class is closed under products, I think. It's um, the... Let me think. No, sorry, it's that the torsion class is closed under pure subobjects. So I don't know if you've come across pure exact sequences, but the, the point is that this torsion free class, this condition ensures that F is um, a so called definable subcategory. So it's closed under pure subobjects, products, and direct limits. Um, it's enough to just the, to ask for direct limits and then it makes it definable and the dual condition for silting is that t is definable and the extra condition that you need for this is pure subobjects i don't know if this answers your question I, it does thank you so much no problem um okay so these new uh, these large torsion classes in the unbounded module category um look like we're considering something new, but in fact, the, the partial order that we obtain is isomorphic to the lattice of torsion classes that we were considering in the first part. Um, and this follows from an old result of crawley Boovey from 94, um, where he shows that if you have a torsion pair in the 
category of finitely generated modules, then you can uh, just close each of the classes under direct limits and you get a torsion pair in the category of all modules. Um, and then since the ring, so, so this gives us an assignment in this direction. And then since the ring is Netherian, if we take any torsion pair in the category of all modules and intersect them with the category of finitely generated modules, then we get a torsion pair in the category of finitely generated modules. So this gives us an order preserving bijection between the lattice of torsion classes in little mod R um, and these co-silting torsion classes in big mod R. Okay. Um, so now uh, the next thing I want to do is relate the HRS tilts of the, so if we have two things related under this bijection, then how do their HRS tilted T structures relate to each other? So we'll take um, tau to be TF, and this is gonna be in tors R, and then under this bijection, we relate to it uh, T big TF, and this is in cosilt R. Um, then I'm going to just fix some notation before I tell you some results. So as before, we're going to uh, denote the HRS tilt of tau um, as blackboard T tau and X tau Y tau and the heart will be H tau. And then for the HRS tilt of um, capital TF, we will use a similar notation, but we'll put an arrow over everything. And I hope this notation will be justified in the next result. Um, so this is due to Manolo Sarin from 2017. Um, and he shows that if you have these two HRS tilted T structures, then they're related in the following way. So the smaller one is the, the smaller aisle is the larger aisle intersected with the bounded derived category. And the larger co aisle is, sorry, the smaller co aisle is the larger co aisle intersected with the bounded derived category. And the heart uh, from the smaller torsion pair is just the bigger heart intersected with the bounded derived category. Um, so this is maybe not too surprising. So we, we have these two torsion pairs sitting inside each other, and then it makes sense that their T structures are also sitting inside each other. Um, but the thing that is sort of more surprising and very nice is that the, the larger heart um, is a locally coherent Grothendieck category. So this means that it's a Grothendieck category whose finitely presented objects is an abelian category. And the finitely presented objects inside this category turn out to be the smaller heart. So this is a very nice relationship. Um, and from this result of Manolo Sarin, we can find the following corollary, which says that if mu and tau are um, related in the ordering in the torsion in tors R, then the following statements are equivalent. This interval between them is a wide interval. And then we already saw that this is equivalent to this intersection T V being a ser subcategory. Uh, sorry, this is a typo. Um, in H mu. And there's some results of Herzog and Krauser that tell us that if you have a SER subcategory in the finitely presented objects of, let me just go back. So if you have a SER subcategory in the category of finitely presented objects of a locally coherent Grothendieck category, and then you close it under direct limits, then what you get is um, the torsion class of a hereditary torsion pair of finite type or a co-silting uh, hereditary torsion pair. Um, so we obtain a further equivalent condition for this interval be, to be wide. Um, and this link here will give us a link uh, to mutation. And this is where um, this is where we kind of in our work um, made this link to wide intervals. Okay, so uh, we now have turning up in our heart, uh, I should say it's a hereditary torsion pair inside 
practice larger hearts. Okay, so let me move on to the final section, um, which relates all of this to co-silting objects in the derived category. Um, so I'm gonna go straight for the kind of abstract definition of co-silting objects. Um, it's possible that you've seen some more um, axiomatic definitions of co-silting objects and in some contexts they coincide. Um, but for me, it will be easier to, to work with this abstract definition. So the first thing I want to do is say that an object in the unbounded derived category for an object, we will denote by TC, um, a pair of subcategories that are, I, I guess this is quite notation heavy. So what this means is that you take the HOM orthogonal, so this means the objects with no HOMs, to the collection of all um, non-positive shifts of C. And then we do the same thing here. So this is the objects in the bounded derived category that have no HOMs, that have no HOMs from, uh, from X, no HOMs from X to any shift of any positive shift of C. So it's this orthogonal and the same on the other side. Um, and then we can employ a definition given independently by Saradakis Vittoria and Nicholas Sarin Svonareva. They say an object in the derived category is called co-silting if this pair is a T-structure. And then in this case, we call this T-structure a co-silting T-structure. And we want to consider these co-silting uh, objects, C and D, up to a notion of equivalence, where we say C is equivalent to D, if and only if their T structures coincide. And this is equivalent to saying that the objects that arise as summands of products of C are the same as the objects that arise as summands of products of D. Okay, so these are um, interesting T structures. They, their hearts are always, um, uh, always have enough injectives and the object C corresponds somehow to the injective cogenerator of the category. Um, and if we um, take our torsion pair in the lattice and we consider the, the HRS tilt uh, that has the extended HRS tilt, so in the unbounded derived category, then this gives us a co-silting um, T structure. And indeed, if, we consider the co-silting object, then we can say something more about it, which is that it's a two-term co-silting object. So its cohomology vanishes everywhere except for degrees zero and one. Um, so let me just show you this example again. So we had this lattice of torsion classes, and I'm just gonna talk about, um, I can't, I don't have time to talk about the whole lattice. So let me just talk about this blue part that I mentioned. Um, so it turns out that if you take any one of these um, torsion pairs in the lattice and you do this HRS tilting construction, then the co-silting object that you get is, um, is given by a module, a, a stalk complex whose module looks um, as I will describe. So what you do um, is for every of every element of this power set, uh, sorry, every element of the projective line, we can define two modules. One is called the lambda proofer module. So this is something like the proofer group and um, the lambda addic module, which is something like the addic, p addic uh, numbers. So for every element of this projective line, we have two modules and we want to build a co-silting um, uh, we want to build a module, a co-silting, a, co a module that will give us a co-silting object in the derived category from a subset of P1. So we take a subset and this gives us, this corresponds to a point in the lattice. Then this uh, point in the lattice corresponds to the module where you take the product of proofer modules where the lambda lives in X and the we direct sum this with the product of the 
quadratic modules were um, for the elements lambda that live outside of this x. Um, I, I hope this is clear. It's a bit, uh, I went a bit fast maybe. So every point in this lattice gives us a subset and this subset determines a module where for every element of that subset, we take a proof of module and for every element that is outside that subset, we take an addic module. And this, um, this module C, if we just take the complex that is just that corresponds to this module concentrated in degree zero, then we get a co-silting T structure that looks like this. And this T structure is the HRS tilt of this point in the lattice. So this is um, somehow everything fits together. Okay, so um, I mentioned that uh, together with my co-authors, we're looking at this notion of mutation. Um, well, this is what I will uh, describe in this theorem and the kind of general idea, so it, it will look a little bit technical, but the general idea is that we take maybe some sum and of our co-silting and we want to um, change it a little bit and get a new co-silting. But in, we don't just take sum ands, we really want to take subsets of um, this subset, this set prod C. So we're gonna fix a co-silting module and then just for technical reasons, we need it to be pure injective, but just uh, this is not important right now. And then we're gonna choose some subset of prod C and we want it to be closed under products and sum ands. So that's why I've written this, but we just take some subset of prod C. Uh, so now if there exists an, a cover um, by this subset, which, um, then, so a cover is, is a, a right approximation of C by E, a minimal one, um, then this cover will allow us to construct a new co-silting object. And the way that we do this is we complete the cover to a triangle in the derived category. And we take the direct sum of the terms E1 and E0. And our theorem says that this is a co-silting object. And we call this object a right mutation of C with respect to curly E. And uh, it also turns out that this curly E is the intersection of the two, the prods of the two objects. So it's kind of saying, the way you can think about this second part of the theorem is to say that we that the two co-silting objects uh, agree on E and then they differ outside of E. This is somehow the spirit of it. Okay, so if this theorem is a bit uh, technical, then I guess the main point is that we can we have this operation of mutation that goes from a co-silting object and gives us another one. And this is um, the kind of, uh, the large version of mutation of Ihara-Ni, um, sorry, of uh, Ihara-Yama, uh, which they do in the context of um, silting complexes. Okay, so this is our notion of mutation. Um, and it turns out that this is related to HRS tilting at hereditary torsion pairs. So um, our one of our main theorems says that if you have two co-silting T structures, and again, for technical reasons, we need to assume that these objects are pure injective, then C is a right mutation, sorry, C prime is a right mutation of C, if and only if, um, the T structure coming from C prime is an HRS tilt of the T structure coming from C with respect to a hereditary torsion pair. So this was suddenly the surprise that we had that our notion of mutation, which is somehow constructive, um, can be related all the way back um, to wide intervals in the lattice of torsion classes. So if you have a wide interval, then this is the same thing as saying that your torsion pair corresponds to a co-silting object that is a right mutation um, of uh, the, the smaller torsion pair in the lattice. Um, and just to finish, 
uh, let me tell you in this example. So we had that each point in this part of the lattice corresponds to a subset of P1. And so if we take um, an interval, so we take two points, then each of these points will be corresponding to subsets um, and they're related by inclusion because this is the, the ordering on the power set. Um, and this mutation you can show corresponds to the operation of taking some proof modules and replacing them with addict modules. So somehow we observe this structural part of the lattice, this wide interval, and we can relate it to this operation of mutation where you're just taking some summons and replacing them with other summons. Um, and this is, uh, this is all I wanted to talk to you about today. Um, so thank you very much for listening.